Uh, Father, we don't believe in coincidence. Uh, we don't believe that things just happen. Uh, we believe, Lord, that you are sovereign, you're in control, and yet you've given the devil certainly a lot of liberty to work his uh, dastardly deeds, and he's worked in the hearts of folks over the years of time, and has done a, 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 a terrible job, or at least a job on really ruining and destroying lives. And so I'm thankful that we can come before you here tonight in prayer and ask for a hedge of protection about us as we look into your word and study it together. We pray that the, the Spirit of God will direct our thoughts to the things that you have for us in your word. I pray that, uh, that our prayer life will again be that which is consistent and pleasing to you and that, Lord, uh, again, even when we come to you in prayer, that our minds will be focused on you. So protect us, Lord, uh, from the evil one. Again, he doesn't want us talking to you. He doesn't want you talking to us by way of your word. And we're asking, Lord, that you're going to do something special here tonight as a result of our time in, of worship and study on this uh, very special day. And so, Lord, we want to commit our time to you. We ask your blessing on it. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So the book of Ephesians chapter 1, let's pick up here in uh, verse 15. Again, we've studied the first 14 verses at length, so we're going to pick up here at verse 15. And I begin with that word, wherefore, and I know that we already spoke about that last week, and so let me just remind you, wherefore is therefore a reason, and it is again pointing us back to the previous verses, especially verses 3 through 14. So I could go on and tell you all about that. I hope to do more of that as the message unfolds, but Hey, wherefore, I also, Paul also says, after I, Paul, heard of your faith. Where was Paul when he was writing this uh, epistle? Well, he was uh, in prison in Rome. Uh, he was many miles removed from uh, the church there at Ephesus, a church that was near and dear to the very heart of this apostle, and yet he's still getting glowing reports of uh, the work that's going on there in the church at Ephesus. And so what an encouragement that is to the apostle. But look what he says, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, please note there that that's not faith in a church. It's not faith in an earthly person. Timothy was probably their current pastor. Uh, I, he didn't say, I'm so happy to hear of your faith in Timothy or your faith in consistently going to church. No, your faith is in the Lord Jesus. And that's so important because people put faith in a lot of things, but the object of our faith has to be Christ. We are in Christ, and our faith is in the Lord Jesus. And so, again, that's going to come back dealing with our position. That's very, very important. We hope to see some of that as, as uh, the message again unfolds. So, so Paul is saying, hey, listen, when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints... It's kind of interesting that faith and love seem to be combined in a number of different writings of Paul. Maybe it was characteristic of his writings. But I do know in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul would write, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. And so there is faith and love, again, combined in the greeting that he uh, brings to the church at Colossae. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, he writes to these believers there, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or fit, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Hey, there is faith and love, and both of them are growing. Both of them are thriving. Uh, they are rejoicing in, again, the great work that God has done. They are trusting him, believing God, and they're extending this love one to another. So great things are taking place in uh, the various churches that Paul was certainly a part of it. And that's what he's addressing here in uh, chapter 15. He said, boy, I tell you, after I heard of your faith in, your, in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And... Uh, I can only think of this. Uh, I, I, I say this uh, time and again. Uh, would to God that, that Kendall Park be known as a church where there's this incredible faith in God, and that's demonstrated on a, on a regular basis. Uh, I, I think of the church again at Thessalonica, but uh, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul would write this, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place 
Your faith to God word is spread abroad. Think of that powerful testimony. Hey, the church at Thessalonica, just a little church, just a little local church like ours, and yet their faith was a, an incredible testimony. It was spread throughout the world. Romans, he would write to these folks there. He said, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Here it is that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I'll tell you, what a powerful testimony for a local church to have, that, that their faith, their love is again uh, being uh, uh, permeating the world. And so I would pray that God would help us again to get to that place where our faith is that strong and incredible and, and uh, we're watching and witnessing God do great things in and through our lives as we trust him and believe him. And by the way, this is a great opportunity to do that during the coronavirus uh, you know, uh, we can again demonstrate that, hey, listen, God, our God is bigger than the coronavirus and we have really nothing to worry about or fear and, uh, and that we would look for ways to extend love to other people. Uh, would to God that he would help us to be able to find ways to do that. Uh, and I'm always looking for more ways that we could certainly be involved in that. Then he goes on and writes this here. As a result of that, he gives thanks. And that was again really uh, Paul's testimony. Paul was a, an individual that was filled with gratitude and I want to tell you, people that are grateful are people that know what God has done for them. I, I always like to remind you that the root word, the Anglo-Saxon word thanks, has this idea to think. In order to thank, you must think. And people that are thankful are people that are constantly thinking about what God has done or how he has blessed them. And so Paul was one of those individuals. He was grateful and he was always sharing his thanks for the various believers that he was able to meet and uh, certainly win to Christ and disciple and then write letters to as, as the years would go on. I hope and pray that you would be a, a thankful person in all of your dealings, and that would be great. Verse 17, Paul would write this. He said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now, this is really important here, folks, because this particular text, Paul really begins his prayer here in verse 17. And please note again, he's addressing it to God, the Father of glory. Now he adds here, it's the, he is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, but then he brings back in the Father of glory. So I don't want to make a big deal of this other than I do believe that there is a pattern that is established in God's word with regard to prayer. We pray to the Father. We pray in Christ's name. Therein lies the power. But we pray uh, through the Holy Spirit. He gives us again the ability. Uh, but, but Christ has made it possible for us to approach the very throne room of God and we address our prayers to the Father. And, and, and Paul is laying out this particular prayer that way. So he's praying to God. He's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of glory. Now that's a little phrase that kind of has uh, interested a lot of people. What does Paul really mean by God the Father being the Father of glory? Is he the originator of glory? I mean, does all glory originate from God? Well, there's certainly uh, room for believing that. Uh, the real glory belongs to God. He is, he is the God of glory, has always been, forever will be. We don't add anything. We can't subtract anything from his glory. He is complete in his glory. He is the Father of glory. Uh, certainly, uh, we... we, we uh, glorify him when we, uh, when we speak well of him to other individuals. So, so we could look at a number of different ways, but he's deemed here the father of glory. And he's asking specifically for this. He says that the father of glory may give unto you, here it is, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There are three things that he asks for right out of the gate here. He asks for wisdom, he asks for uh, revelation, and he asks for the knowledge of him. Uh, wisdom. And by the way, this is the spirit of wisdom. So that would be the essence or the quality of wisdom. And this wisdom is that word Sophia in the original language, which really talks about uh, this uh, insight, this, uh, this insight into the real nature of things, the true nature of things. Uh, this is not just earthly wisdom. This is, this is a special wisdom. So, so in the spirit or in the essence of this wisdom and revelation, well, that's certainly, again, God making himself known to us. Uh, he is, again, the object of the matters that are going to be discussed here. He is the father of glory, and he's asking, again, that, that God would give us this wisdom here in verse 17, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, in the knowledge of him. And the knowledge of him, I, I want you to, again, understand that. That is that we could know God better. Uh, I, I love, if you, again, take some time, you can go to the book of Philippians, chapter 3, and verse 14, and... And there you could, you could see Paul uh, telling the, the Philippian believers there that, that I want to know him, that I may know him, are the exact words in Philippians 3.14. 
And uh, what is Paul really saying? He says, hey, listen, I know who God is, but I want to know him better. I want to know him more intimately. I don't want to just have some kind of a surface knowledge of, of God. I, I want to know this God. Uh, boy, again, all of these things, I, I hope that the Spirit of God could work in your heart as he works in my heart. Would that be our prayer? That God, you would give me this wisdom and, and understanding and in, uh, in, in, uh, in how you have revealed yourself to us and that I could even know you better, that I would have the knowledge of you. Uh, that's Paul's desire, and he's praying that for these believers there at Ephesus. And then he goes on and tells us here in this text here that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He's asking again that God would open up their minds, that, that their minds would really come to understand uh, these truths that are going to follow. And he's going to lay out three more truths, that, that the, the eyes of your understanding, your mind would be enlightened, that ye may know, here it is again, we're right back to the knowledge of him, that ye may know these truths. And again, this is, a, this is not just some kind of superficial knowledge. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a knowledge that will take us uh, deeper. Um, I, I like this idea of even this uh, of being enlightened. Uh, the way that's written in the original language, it, it deals with this perfect tense. And I, I know that that might not mean a whole lot to you, but here's what that word really means. It has the idea of a past action with continuing results. And that simply says that the knowledge of God is not a once and done thing, that we can never get enough of the knowledge of God. Uh, I, I wonder even if we're in eternity a billion years, if we're really going to know God, uh, because we'll always be, again, a limited being. We will not be God. We'll be in his presence. But we have a desire to know him. And so, yes, we have knowledge of the past, but it has continuing results, and we want to know him more and even better as time goes on. And here's what he would say, that your, that your mind would be enlightened, that you may know three things. Number one, the hope of his calling. Number two, the riches of the glory of, of his inheritance. And number three, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. So, so Paul is uh, going to say here now when he comes that, okay, so I have addressed this to God, the Father of glory, uh, that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And then he goes on and says, then may God enlighten you. May he open your mind to some more truths. And number one truth would be this hope of his calling. The, hope, the, the word hope in, in Scripture is always referred to as this confident expectation. Uh, it's not this wishful thinking. It's not pie in the sky. It's not, it's not just, well, I hope that's... No, no. I confidently expect that God who has, has called me has a, has a work for me to do. He has something in mind for me to accomplish. He wants me to bring glory to his name. So, so he's saying to the believers there, I want you to know the reason why God saved you, uh, the reason God called you, the reason God brought you into the fold. He has a purpose and he has something, and you need to know confidently what that calling is. It's the same word that's going to be used later on when you get to chapter 4. Uh, of the same book here. And so you can look over to chapter 4 real quick, verse 1. Paul writes, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. That's the word calling there, of the calling wherewith ye are called. In other words, again, know what God has called you for. Why did God save you? He didn't save you so that you and I could just say, hey, listen, I got a home reserved for me in heaven. No, he's called us to serve him, to live for him, to bring glory to his name. And so when you get to chapter 4, he's going to begin to make some application of these first things, uh, these, these truths here in the first couple chapters of, uh, of uh, the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters. So he says, number one, I want you to know the hope of uh, his calling. And by the way, again, it is God's calling, not our calling. We didn't do anything to get saved other than respond to a gracious invitation to come, come unto him. And, uh, and our great God and Savior reached down from the glories of heaven and saved our souls. And for that, we are grateful. And then he says this, number two thing, uh, the second thing he wants us to understand here with regard to this uh, enlightened mind here in, in uh, uh, verse uh, 18, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Number one, that you know the hope of his calling. Number two, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Folks, this was really interesting. I, I, I had a lot of fun with this because uh, at first I'm thinking this is our inheritance. But you got to look at every word because every word is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's inheritance. It's not our inheritance. Our inheritance was addressed back here in verse uh, 11. 
Look back at verse 11, the same chapter here, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And he's going to refer to the inheritance that is coming to us as the believers in Christ. But when you get down here to chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 18, he's talking about the riches of the glory of God's inheritance, which is in the saints. And so I kind of got lost in some of that. Let's talk about it quickly. The riches, that really would steal, deal with this idea of the abundance of the glory. The glory would be the immensity and the grandeur of God and in all of his glory and majesty. So this is the abundance of the glory of God's inheritance, which is in the saints. Folks, this I found interesting that we, the saints, are the inheritance of the Father as well as the Son. And the reason being is that both of them have invested in us. God the Father invested in us in giving us the very best heaven could give us. He gave us his Son. And Jesus Christ invested in us by giving us his life. So they have a lot at stake here. And so the Father invested, the Son invested, and by God's grace, we came to understand that, and we were gloriously saved. And now, as the text would present itself here, we are the inheritance of the Father. So the Father is looking forward to us coming home to be with him for all of eternity. And I found that very, very interesting. Just as a man's wealth brings glory to his name, well, so God gets glory from his church. Uh, because of the investment that he has, uh, that he has uh, 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 put into us. So I want you to think about uh, the future in this sense here uh, for just a few minutes. Think of the uh, later on in chapter 5 of the same book, and we won't have you turning to that because, again, we could be here for quite a while. But there the Bible says this, Husbands, love your wives, listen to this, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We got that, pat, uh, th that part down. Why did, why did Christ love the church and give himself for it? Well, the text goes on. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. Listen. That he might present it. What's the it? The church to himself. Here it is. A glorious church. So listen. Christ invested his life in us so that we would come to know him. But that's not the end of it. He wants to go on and sanctify us and, and continue to have us to be set apart unto him and to cleanse us with the washing of his word. And he's preparing us so that when we get to heaven, he can present ourselves to him as well as the Father as a glorious bride, a glorious church. That's kind of an interesting thought. God deals with us on the basis of our future, not our past. Hey, I'm happy for that. Because uh, we all have some skeletons in the closet that we're not proud of. I'm happy for the future that is yet ahead of us. Think of a couple individuals. Think of cowardly Gideon. When he came to Gideon, he says, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Was Gideon a mighty man of valor when God came to him and said, Hey, Gideon, I have a job for you to do. Are you kidding? He's the guy that put the fleece out before the Lord. And said, hey, listen, I, uh, leave this to be dry and wet all around it and vice versa. And, and, uh, and on he went. Gideon was hardly a, a man of valor. But guess what? The future tense of Gideon was he became the mighty man of valor. See, God was again anticipating the future for this man. Hey, Peter was no different. Hey, wimpy Peter. I call him wimpy Peter. And by the way, I, I say that respectfully because uh, uh, I have the same disease that Peter has, foot and mouth disease. And, and uh, Peter was always saying and doing things, and then he kind of he had to retract those things as time went on. Hey, listen, he says, Thou art Simon, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is a stone. Hey, listen, was Peter this stone? Was he, was he this guy that they could really rally around when, when that was shared with, uh, with Peter? Uh, uh, no, it wasn't. It was very on, early on in the ministry, the public ministry of Christ. And yet Christ was looking at the future of this individual and said, Hey, listen, I got something special for you. Hey, Cephas or Simon, you're going to be called Cephas. You're going to be called a stone. Did Peter become that, that rock, as it were? Yes, he did. Uh, he, he, was, he was a pillar of, of faith uh, in the latter end of his life. And so, so I'm happy that, that God looks to the future. And what he's looking for here with this idea of 
the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is he's looking forward to that day when we will all be there with him. In fact, somebody has suggested this, and I think it's kind of interesting. This truth really suggests to us that Christ will not enter into his promised glory until the church is there to share it with him. Why? Because we are his glory, and he's looking to present us as a glorious church, and uh, it would be the same with regard to the Father here. And we could look at a couple of these things. Christ prayed for, for this glory before his death. You could read about that in John chapter 17. Uh, Christ will certainly be glorified in us and through us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we are certainly glorified him. Colossians 3 verse 4, there's a number of different places that we could go to. So number one, the hope of our calling, God's calling in our lives. Number two, he said, hey, I am praying that your mind will be enlightened with regard to the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. That's you and I. And number three, he says, and that you might also know this, the exceeding greatness of his power to, uh, to us word, who believe, now look at this, according to the working of his mighty power. Verse 19 is really exploding with power. I, I kid you not. Four times the word power is mentioned there. It may not show up that way in uh, the English here, but let me just tell you. The exceeding greatness of his power, that's number, uh, that's number one. Uh, and then it goes on and says, uh, to us word who uh, believe according to the working, that's the word energized. We are energized by way of this power. It's the same idea. And the, the, uh, to, the, to the working of his mighty. A mighty is another word in the original language that deals with power. And then the last word, power, deals with strength. Mighty, mighty has this idea of uh, uh, incredible power that really is only limited to God. It's only used of God uh, by way of maybe Christ and some of the miracles. That's the idea of might. Uh, the last word, strength there, or power, has the idea of this innate strength that belongs to, again, to Christ. So he's talking about power, working, mighty, power. Four times the word power is used. And you know what Paul is praying? He is praying that the believers at Ephesus would understand what the exceeding greatness of this power is in them. He's not praying that they would make use of this power. He's simply saying, I want you believers to understand what power is at your disposal. It is there. This is incredible power. This is mighty power. This is, this is power that energizes you. This is the, 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 the power of God that is in the believer. So, folks, again, if you just, I, I, I mean, that's a preachable verse right there in itself. There is no reason for us to fail. Uh, we fail when we get our eyes off of God. We fail when we don't consider some of these truths in our lives. Do you realize what's at our disposal to succeed in our walk with God, with Christ? Uh, we have this incredible power that's been, been given to us. And he's going to go on and then tell us that this power has been demonstrated. In fact, before I even tell you how it's been demonstrated, if I were to ask you the question, what do you think the greatest demonstration of the power of God is? I mean, I want you to just think about it. Some of you might think, and I, and I like to play this game, I like to challenge you, and I think I've done this before with you. If you think about the greatest, might, the greatest demonstration of God's power, some of you might think, well, maybe creation. I mean, after all, God just simply spoke and things happened, and, and in six days, this world came into existence. What incredible power! And that's true. It is incredible power. Some of you might go to the parting of the Red Sea where Moses just holds out that rod and this, the wind just takes that water and just blows it back and uh, allows uh, a couple million people to cross over on dry land. And then think about it, the coincidence of the timing of the event as the Egyptian army is in hot pursuit, the waves again, or the water recedes back to where it was, swallows up the Egyptian army. You talk about power, that's a pretty powerful example of God and what he's able to do. You could go to uh, Christ taking the five loaves and the two fish that we referred to this morning and, and praying over it, blessing it, and feeding, now listen, some 5,000 men plus. I mean, wh where do you see that kind of power? But he's going to tell us the greatest demonstration of power follows in the very next verse. Look what the very next verse says. I want you, in verse 19, just to stay with the context, to understand the exceeding greatness of the power that is to us word, that we have available to us. Who believe? It's, again, limited to the believers, verse 19. According to the energizing power that belongs to God that's innate with him. That's how you could look at verse 19. Which he wrought in Christ, which he brought about in Christ. Look at this. 
when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. The greatest demonstration of power is raising a person back to life. Now listen, there's been several people raised back to life even before Christ. I believe uh, uh, Elisha, Elisha had some opportunity to do that and, and uh, some of the other disciples. Uh, Christ raised a number of individuals, Lazarus being one of them. And so, so people have been raised back to life. But folks, they were raised back to an earthly life. Uh, they came back with pretty much the same body that, uh, that went into the tomb. Uh, they, were just, uh, they were just given an extension here on this earth. But they had to die a second death they, or uh, another death. They had to die again here on this earth. But Christ's resurrection was unique in the sense that his resurrection was a resurrection unto eternal life. His resurrection was with a body that was prepared for eternity. His resurrection was different than every other resurrection of, of dead people prior to that. Christ's resurrection is unique. And I believe it's probably the greatest demonstration of the power of God to take a lifeless body where there is no breath, there's no heart that's beating, there's no brain activity, dead as dead could be, and bring it back to life with a body that is prepared for eternity. Only God can do that. And what Paul is saying is, hey, I want you believers at Ephesus to understand that's the power that's available for you and for me. It's in us. It's there. It's toward us. Are you kidding? I mean, th that's incredible power at our disposal. So that's why I say when you think about the, 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 the teachings of this text here, it's like, why would we ever, why would we ever go awry? Why would we ever go wayward? Why would we do that? We have everything at our disposal to succeed in the life that God has called us to live. And this power, not only did it bring Christ back to life, but it certainly brought him back into his home, into heaven. The text tells us here that, that uh, God wrought this power in Christ when God the Father raised him from the dead and set him, Christ, at God the Father's own right hand in heavenly places. He ascended into the presence of the Lord. And there he is seated, even as we speak, ever living to make intercession for you and I. Uh, the God that, again, certainly says, hey, listen, this, this ability and power is available. Uh, boy, go on and live the life now that I want you to live. And he's going to tell us a couple more things. So number one, he says, um, I, want you to, I want you to look at this again. Three things with regard to the enlightened mind. Verse 18, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. There are three things that Paul's praying for with regard to the believers, in addition to what he already mentioned in verse 17. And then this power that he's praying for has got three applications. Demonstrate it the greatest way, by way of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ being raised to new life and ascending into the presence of his Father. Secondly, verse 21 when he ascended into the presence of his Father, he was far above all principality and power and might and dominion. He's really talking about here, and these, th this, is, this is terminology that, that is applicable to the angelic realm. That, that when Christ came back into heaven, he went, again, right to the top. Y you couldn't get any higher, as it were. He, he ascended into the presence of his Father far above any angel. And listen, the angels have been there for those uh, 33 years that Christ was here on this earth. Uh, the angels were there, and mighty angels, Gideon, um, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Gabriel, uh, Michael, the archangel. Uh, there's some pretty powerful angels that are going to encounter the devil. And, and, uh, and yet when Christ ascended, this power was demonstrated through Christ in that he went far above the angelic realm and taking his place back, as it were, in heaven. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and in every name, that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Uh, uh, parallels, the Philippians chapter 2, that, uh, that was given unto him a name which is above every name, uh, every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And so I believe this power is demonstrated by the resurrection and ascension of Christ, number one. Number two, by way of his position in heaven above any, any, any being that would be there in heaven. And number three... This power is demonstrated in verse 22 and 23, where God the Father has put all things under Christ's feet 
and gave Christ to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is, again, a manifestation of the power with regard to this. God gave him to be the head. Headship speaks of authority. He is the head of the church. He is the authority of the church. We could read that again later in chapter 5, verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the authority of the church. It's repeated again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, where Christ is the head of the body of the church, which, uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and the text would go on from there. He is the head, it says here, uh, uh, over all things to the church, which is his body. The idea of a body is it's speaking of a metaphor of God's redeemed people. Obviously, it's used exclusively in the New Testament because the, the, the church wasn't even known in the Old Testament. So this is a unique term here where Christ is again of the head of the church, which is his body. And then it goes on and says, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And that's again a phrase that... that uh, uh, is certainly interesting to dissect as well. We could certainly say that the Christ is the head of the body uh, because the church is, and it is filled, uh, he, uh, the, the church is filled by him, that, that the church is continuing to grow. We would even pray tonight that the church would grow by maybe somebody that's watching this would get saved and be added to the body of Christ. And so that would be this idea that Christ is still fulfilling uh, this body of his, that he, Christ, the fullness of all that filleth all in all. Or some would go on and maybe look at this idea that he is the head of the body, uh, filling for himself the church with blessings. And there's truth to that. He continues to bless his church in tremendous ways. Either way you want to look at it, that's up to you. But I know this, that what, what uh, Paul is saying to the believers at Ephesus is that there is some incredible power that is at our disposal. And he demonstrates that through, again, the physical resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ. Number two, he, he certainly wants them to know that when he ascended into heaven, he sent it far above all the principality and power and angels that are up there. And number three, he has also made him to be the head of the church, which is his body, uh, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So we could say that this would end Paul's prayer here in chapter 1. He's demonstrated to believers who have all these spiritual blessings, verses 3 through 14, that the believers would come to know God intimately, verse 17, that he would know him in order that they might know these facts. The past with regard to the hope of our calling, the future with regard to the inheritance that is God via us, his church, and the present with regard to the power that is available to the believers, as is demonstrated in the resurrection and ascension of Christ, the future headship, I should say, uh, in the future with regard to the headship that Christ has over all of heaven, and certainly, again, the, the present manifestation of uh, his involvement in, uh, in over the church, the headship over the church here. All right, so that's chapter 3, or chapter 1, verses 15 to uh, 23 here. Now the heart of the message, the heart of the message. And um, I, I don't think we're going to really do a lot of uh, service to this because I, have, I literally have three and a half pages of notes here that I really want to drive this point home with, uh, to you here. So what I'd like to do is uh, I want you to just kind of, just kind of, let's take a pause, let's catch our breath here. Uh, let's kind of reflect on some of these things here that we have learned in chapter 1. And uh, by God's grace, if the Lord Jesus tarries and allows us to be here another week, we'll be back again next Sunday night. And uh, we can take up maybe the summary of chapter 1 here in the book of Ephesians and really try to make some, some application uh, to the believer here in uh, understanding some of the wonderful truths that we have in Christ, and it really is. There are some, some incredible truths as far as that wonderful position that we have in him. And I'll just kind of whet your appetite uh, for this here, and then we'll, we'll close in prayer. But you know, the, as a believer in Christ, you know where we struggle? We, we struggle with regard to, we often want to jump right ahead to the application of the text. And, 
and begin to flesh out these truths. And, and I think that there's certainly a place for that. We, we, need to, we don't want to just be uh, people that walk around with our head filled with all knowledge because as Scripture tells us, knowledge puffs up. So, so as God gives us this knowledge, yes, it needs to be fleshed out. But here's the problem. I think sometimes we get the cart before the horse. And as a believer in Christ, we begin to try to really flesh out the truths of God's word. And we really don't understand what we have available to us. We don't understand really our position that we have in Christ. And so we spent a lot of time here just going through chapter 1 and looking at some of these incredible doctrines and truths that are available to us, that we have. And, and what, what Paul is trying to say is it's those truths that ought to motivate you and challenge you then to go on and live the life that is pleasing to Christ. But again, I'm telling you, sometimes we get it backwards. And we try to live the life and we fail, and we fail, and we fail, and we don't understand, and we, we complicate things, and we get messed up. And that's because we never really understood the fundamental foundation of our life and what we have in Christ. And that position that we have is as secure as secure can be. No one can take that away from us. So uh, it's going to get interesting at least. Uh, let me just, let me just uh, oh boy, I really want to go down that road, but I am not going to do that here because I'll be here for another half hour. Uh, I, I hope that you'll come back next Sunday night. I really do. And, and just uh, listen to some of the truths that God has for us here by way of making some application of chapter 1. And uh, I, my heart has been blessed by the study of it, and I hope that yours will be as well as we come back and study it together again next week. Well, let's thank the Lord for our time here together tonight, and we want to ask God's blessing uh, on the ministry of His Word and uh, try to, to say that uh, may the Spirit of God help us to make some sense of the things that we've heard. And then we're going to close with a song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Uh, I want to tell you something. There is something to be said about that. Uh, listen, you only got one tongue, uh, and I only have one tongue. But I like what the songwriter is trying to say. Would to God I had a thousand of these tongues to sing his, his, uh, his praise. He is worthy of that praise. And then he'll go on to talk about all kinds of great things in this, uh, this particular song. And we're going to sing just a few verses of it. But I trust that, but that you'll, you'll reflect on the song and the, the lyrics and the message of it uh, in light of, again, all that we have in Christ. So let's thank the Lord for the great evening. Father, you've blessed us. I'm thankful again for our time here together. And Lord, as was somewhat expected, I, I, I felt that we may not be able to get through it all. But Lord, I want to take that from you. Uh, I want to believe, Lord, that you're in this and that, Lord, you have limited our time. And I pray that the things that we've heard, we'd go back on, uh, go back over and look over and reflect and meditate and think on. And, and really, again, look to draw a summary of this chapter here by way of our, our concluding study of chapter 1 next week. But until then, Lord, there's plenty to get excited about. Uh, obviously, Lord, uh, uh, to just meditate on this power that, that is at our disposal. Uh, incredible, energizing power, mighty power. Uh, Lord, it, it's there for us. And, and when we get to chapter 3, you'll, we'll see, Lord, where Paul is praying that now this power would be demonstrated in and through our lives. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for being such a great God. Thank you for revealing yourself to us the way you have. Thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts, not just our minds, but to our hearts. And Lord, for that, we'll certainly thank you. Thank you for our time here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. songs to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's
bow together for a word of prayer tonight. Father, uh, you've been so good to us. Uh, it's been a great day of worship as we've been able to listen to your word preached this morning from Proverbs and then now tonight from Ephesians 2. pray that you would uh, help us not to be quick to forget what we've heard today, but meditate on the truths and to think about them and apply them to our life even throughout this week. Uh, help us now to have a great week, um, relying on you, trusting in you, um, not uh, walking in fear, but in faith in what's ahead. And I pray that you'd help our church family as we're in different places. I pray that you'd watch over them, keep them safe, keep them healthy. Pray, Lord, if that anybody has any specific needs, uh, they would let us know and that you would provide and take care of our family, uh, church family, while we're not able to meet together. Bring us back soon uh, to be able to meet in one place once again, Father, and we'll give you the glory for it. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week. We trust our worship service and that Bible message was a spiritual help to you. If you still have some questions about God, maybe about our church, or how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we would love to answer any and all of your questions. All of our contact information can be found on our website, kpbc.net. Thank you for watching our service today.